Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. It's a beautiful day out. Uh, so my name is Natasha, and uh, I've been doing Swift since day one, pretty much. So I was at WWC, went home the first day, started learning it, and uh, I've been working with it and always evolving and learning new things. Uh, so uh, protocol-oriented programming. Uh, so I'm going to talk about that uh, because that's kind of the heart of Swift. So at WWDC last year, uh, there was this protocol-oriented programming in Swift session, and hopefully you all watched it. If you watch one video from WWDC 2015, this is the video to watch. Um, and one big thing that happened also was that Swift got protocol extensions, um, and then since then there'll be other features. So uh, protocols are basically at the heart of Swift. Uh, Dave Abrahams, who gave the talk, is um, he called himself Professor Blowing Your Mind, <laughs> which, you know, like if you're going to call yourself that, you better deliver. Um, and he did. Like he actually blew everyone's mind. Um, and one of the things he said was that Swift is a protocol oriented language. And, uh, you know, he's not kidding. If you actually look in the Swift standard library, you will see like everything conforms to protocols over and over again, and um, so you should probably be using it. Uh, but one thing that happened was uh, in the talk, uh, he talked about drawables as an example. Um, and for me, that was hard to relate to. So I knew what he was saying was amazing. And I was like, this is blowing my mind because I don't understand most of this, but it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> But um, it was really hard for me to understand. So when I got back to my job, um, you know, as programmers, we're using kind of the same patterns almost every day. We're used to kind of the same. When we have to add a feature, we already know in our head, oh, I've done this 100 times before. I'm just going to do it this way. In our case, if you're coming from Objective-C and iOS development, you probably have like object-oriented programming in mind. And protocols are a pretty new way to think about things. So. For me, while I knew that you know protocols were amazing, and this guy like blew my mind, and he said all these amazing things, um, I didn't actually know like where do I start? How how do I actually start using this in my code? Uh, so that was something that while like I knew I needed to use this, it took me a while to um, actually start using it. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about kind of use cases that I've used it for and I'm learning to use it for <laughs> that are um, very practical. So it's not about drawables. Uh, if you do that, then you should watch the talk and it'll probably be more, re more relatable to you. Uh, but hopefully if you're like an everyday iOS developer, uh, my goal is to make this uh, some examples of where you can use protocols to improve your code in like very small but powerful ways. Uh, so. Hopefully, uh, you've all dealt with this. So these are pretty common things if you're uh, doing iOS stuff. Um, so today, I'm going to talk about how you can improve your views, table view, view controllers, networking. Um, yeah, so we're going to get started, uh, starting with views. Um, so let's say your product manager comes over, and you know they say something simple like, hey, I want this view, and then when I click shake, it starts shaking because uh, it's a milkshake. Uh, so that's pretty simple, uh, you know, just like an animation on a view. Um, so, you know, I do what I always do with animations. I go to Stack Overflow. <laughs> uh, so if you Google, you know, like st uh, shake animation, you're going to come up with someone that already did this work for you, so you don't actually have to do it, which is really nice. Um, but you can still modify some you know, how far it shakes and things like that. Uh, but, you know, where they don't say where to put this, so I kind of understand the shake part. Uh, where do I put this in my architecture? So in my case, you know, I just had a view, and then I just wanted to shake, so I'm going to subclass um, an image view, which was like an image in, my, in that example, and then I'm just going to say, hey, this view is going to shake. It's very simple. Um, now in my, you know, I connect it in my storyboard, I add the image view, I can add more logic here to set the image, um, but now I have the shake method. And now in my view controller, you know, I have, I connect my IB outlet or IB action for the shake button, 
and then I get my image and I just say shake. So, you know, pretty easy. We're happy with this. It works. Um, that's good. It works. Uh, so I think at that point I'd be done. Uh, but then the product manager, because we're never done, <laughs> uh, the product manager is going to come back and they're going to say, well, you know, it doesn't look right when just the view shakes. I want the button to shake as well. So when you click, the button also shakes. Um, so, you know, I'd probably go ahead and do the same thing. Um, I subclass my shake, you know, button, create a shakeable button, add some shake uh, logic. Uh, now in my view controller, I now, when they click the shake button, I shake the view and the button. So, you know, uh, hopefully you're like, this is a warning sign, this is bad. Because <laughs> uh, I just repeated the same code in two places. So, you know, at least two views in my project have to have the shake animation. Um, and you don't want to duplicate code because the product manager might come back tomorrow and say, hey, I want it to shake like more violently or, <laughs> or just like do some other crazy thing. <laughs> so um, you, you want to isolate that code uh, to one place where you can go ahead and change it and it'll impact the views that need to shake. Um, so if you've done Objective-C, uh, one way you would do this it th is through categories. Um, so you would, and this is the same in Swift, uh, I can uh, extend UI view and I can add the, sh the same shake method in here and now both my button and my image view have the shake method. Um, but the problem is, <laughs> if you ever done it, um, it kind of becomes this monster because first you're going to put the shake that, you know, in the extension and the next thing you're going to put some kind of fireworks animation and then you're going to keep adding things to your UI view extension until you're, it's just like such a big mess and you don't even know why things are there and it becomes kind of unusable. Um, and then when you have a view, you have no idea that like shake is available really. Like you, I've done this before where there was an extension for something, but then um, I didn't know, so I would just, you know, add my own shake method because you have no idea <laughs> that it's there uh, because there's just so many <laughs> things that it becomes this big Frankenstein monster. Uh, so how can we improve on this uh, with Swift? Uh, and one way is through protocols, of course, based on the talk topic. <laughs> uh, hopefully you guessed that. Um, so instead, we can create a shakeable uh, protocol and the cool thing about protocol extensions is that uh, we can actually constrain them. So now this uh, shake animation, uh, you know, it it's only works for UI views. If any other object implements shakeable, nothing is going to happen. So it's not, you know, dangerous or anything. Um, so this works only for UI views. Uh, so very simple, you just took out the library uh, or the code and instead of putting it into a category, you just put it in a protocol. Okay, done. What does this buy you? Uh, well, now you have this, you just extend shakeable and now this image view uh, has the shake, shake thing, uh, shake function, and so does the button. Uh, but the real thing is, when I look at this button and I look at this image, I immediately know that sh shaking is part of its functionality. Versus like if you had a big view, you might have shake, you might have all kinds of things, but by making it shakeable, I know that this is like a big functionality of this view and I should probably use it or that's like a big thing. So without looking at any code in this whole view, which obviously you will have a lot more in here, um, you can already tell what it's doing. And same thing for, let's say your product manager does come back and say, hey, when it shakes, I want it to also dim a little or become a different color. Well, you can also extend that in a protocol and now you can say it's dimmable. So very quickly, just by glancing at the declaration, you can already tell a lot of the functionality that's in here. Um, and imagine if this was an extension, you would have to, like, you have no idea that that's available even, or that that's the purpose of this view is to shake or be dimmable. Um, and of course, uh, for refactoring purposes, uh, this is very easy. As soon as your manager says, you know, like, I don't like shaking anymore, I just want dimmable, you just delete the protocol part. Okay, now it's only dimmable. So refactoring is simple. simple. It's very, um, 
piecewise. It's really awesome. <laughs> uh, but you know, like uh, using protocols this way to do this mix-in functionality, um, it makes your code very readable, it makes it reusable, maintainable, um, and people can immediately see exactly what you know, the purpose of your code is for views. Um, and for further reading, uh, there's a good uh, blog post for, by Totem Training, and they, they do kind of like a dimmable one that I mentioned, but they do a cool one where it like shows up with navigation. Uh, so if you want like a more advanced uh, implementation than just shaking, uh, this would be a good example to look at. But you can now imagine you can do this for your transitions, for any type of things. You can immediately use protocols, mix and match, delete them easily, add them in. Um, it's very modular. So now the next one, uh, table view controllers <coughs> and using protocols with that. Um, so for this example, this is pretty easy. Um, we just have a table view that has photos of food uh, from different countries. Um, there are square donuts, which was cool, <laughs> um, in Budapest. Um, but yeah, so this is a simple view controller and a table view controller. And um, this is the logic that we use a lot of times. We have to, whenever we create a table view controller, uh, if, you have, if you use nibs, then you have to kind of get the nib and then register the nib, and then later dequeue the cell. So this is code that we use over and over again, and it's horrible uh, <laughs> because you know, it's kind of string-based. Uh, that's how the API works. It's not our fault. Uh, <laughs> um, so immediately, there's just some annoying things that we could see. There's duplicate, typing, string-based is not great. I used to use constants, which is not great. Um, so immediately, um, we can see like, okay, here's some annoyances. It's also two lines. I always have to repeat the same two lines. And then at the same time, uh, one convention that I personally use, and I know that's pretty popular uh, in the community, is that I name my nibs, nib names and my cell reuse identifiers uh, to be the same as the class name. So immediately you could see kind of duplicate code because it's string based, but it also is something that could easily be more dynamic based on the class. So this is, um, in Objective-C, I used uh, NS string from class to kind of solve this problem. Uh, so I would just take my class and I, uh, in Swift, to just string, so it's a lot nicer looking. Uh, but, you know, it's still, when you look at it, you're just like, okay, you know, what am I doing? <laughs> uh, but it's not great, but it works. Um, so how can we make this better? Well, we're going to use protocols. <laughs> well, you guess that. Um, so the first step is uh, the reuse identifier. Uh, we can have a reusable view protocol, and uh, this I think the other one also. If you're just going to use the protocol on the UI kit, uh, UI kit is all classes. Um, so then you can just say that only classes can implement that. So now your enums and structs uh, they can't even use this protocol. So that's a way to constrain it even more, uh, especially as you're working on improving kind of some of the flaws with the UIKit. Um, so we have this reusable view. And again, we're using the constraints to say that this only applies to UI views. Uh, and we can create a reuse identifier that's generic um, or just this default. Um, and all it does is the same thing we just did. It, takes, it just takes the class and it creates it into a string. So no strings here, or no, you don't even have to do uh, the actual class name. So very simple. Um, we just created a default reuse identifier. And now we can extend every single table view cell to have a reusable view. Uh, so now every single table view cell has a reuse identifier for free. We never have to worry about stringifying it, what's the class name, and remember, I have to look that up. It's kind of annoying. <laughs> Uh, so this kind of solves uh, some of the issues. Um, and you can see it's already reusable, because now when you, do, when you say for cell reuse identifier, you do table view cell reuse identifier. It's much more readable. You understand what you're using versus when you do that weird like string cell name. Um, it's less 
it's less clear what's happening, except like, you know, we all know what's happening because we've kind of used this pattern over and over again. But um, if you have an intern or someone <laughs> from CS, they might just be like, sure, and they might not even know to go and like change the reuse identifier in the storyboard, uh, theoretically. Um, and now uh, we can do the exact same thing for nib names. Uh, again, like I named them after the class name. So we just have another protocol that's just for nibs, nib, nib loadable view. And it's going to have the same thing. It's just going to return a default nib name, which is just the class name as a string. So again, same thing, very simple. Uh, now we can extend any cell that does load from nib. Uh, you can just add that in nib loadable view. And this is also, again, for readability really nicely, because when I look at the cell, I know immediately without having to look at it for a nib file, I immediately know that, hey, this cell is going to come from a nib. So it's already adding some value. Uh, but then, of course, we can take the cell, we get the nib name, and now we get the string version of our identifier. And then, you know, going back to the original, uh, it's more readable because I can immediately know what's going on. This is the nib name. This is the reuse identifier. I don't have to worry about, um, about it. You know. So it's already nicer, but it's not that great. Let's make it better. Um, and the magic comes, again, for taking those two lines of code of registering the nib. And we can now uh, extract it using generics uh, with Swift. And using generics, we can say that any type that uh, conforms to the reusable view uh, protocol and the nib, nib loadable view protocol, uh, we're going to take create a nib from it and using the nib name, which is the only method for the nib loadable view protocol. And then we're just going to register it. So now we're combining here generics plus protocols, you know, uh, to make and taking away those two lines of code. Um, because they're really reusable, you know, we to keep typing them over and over again in our code, <laughs> in every project, uh, pretty much. So this is um, it's like a small extension on UI table view. So now we go from something like this, uh, where we have two lines of code, maybe we're using strings, maybe some other magic, um, to just this one line of code. And it's very easy to remember, right? You're just saying table view, register, my cell type. And then um, it does, it registers the nib, it does the reuse identifier, it does everything for you. So now every single table view, you just do this and you're good to go. Um, and then uh, you can do the same thing, you, can, you know, combining the generics and the protocols, uh, you can uh, also do that for dequeuing a cell. So just like uh, we did for registering nib, for cell logic dequeuing, it's the same logic that we do over and over again, and it's kind of annoying because we have to use the reuse identifier. So you either have some kind of constant, you're using the string version, you're repeating whatever the reuse identifier. So we already have that with a reusable view protocol. Um, and then the other thing is with Swift, we have uh, optionals. So when you dequeue the cell, you have to say what type is it. Um, and we can basically use guard. And this is what you would do just in the cell. But by using guard, you now have you know, like extra three lines of code. You're, you're saying, is it this type? If yes, keep going. If not, don't. So even though it's like a few lines of code, it's nice to get rid of it um, and make the code safer. Uh, so this is before, so this is in the actual cell. Uh, you would have table view, DQ, cell with identifier, and this is where you would have that identifier as a string or a constant or like whatever you have. Um, and then you have to say, is it this type of cell? If it's this type of cell, continue. If it's not, uh, do this. So this is just annoying code that we have to repeat um, in all table views, pretty much. Um, and by using the you know, combination of generics with protocols, uh, we get it down to a very nice one-liner of uh, you know, table view DQ for cell for index path. Uh, you do have to say what type it is, but you're not force unwrapping the optional. You're not using guard. You don't have to worry about kind of maybe like 
the more annoying parts of Swift or <laughs> the more verbose uh, parts of Swift where you have to make sure that this type exists. Uh, and these are the safer type, you know, safe um, good things of Swift, but we can kind of hide those away uh, because we don't, they're repeated, we don't need them, we can kind of hide them away and then use a nicer version of this. Um, and the way it works uh, is because the type can be anything. If you do have two types of cells, so in this case I have a dessert table view cell, um, you can just, when you say what type it is as this, it, know, it basically already registered it, it gets the right type. So um, it works really well and it's very pretty compared to having a guard let for every single cell you dequeue with a fatal error or you know, force unwrapping is the other way to do it. Um, so you kind of have a nice, nice pretty usable UI kit <laughs> that's readable uh, you know, versus kind of what we have today. Um, yeah, so using uh, protocols and generics, uh, you can basically take away some of the ugliness of UI kit, especially as it's used with Swift and like optionals and you can kind of hide it away a little bit with protocols and have a much nicer Swiftier API, um, you know, until Apple fixes it and <laughs> make, makes things more Swifty, hopefully, in the in UI kit. Uh, but there are some other, you know, it, it's going to take a while probably. So until that, you can add a few small things with protocols to make it a lot nicer. Uh, so this was actually not my personal solution. Uh, it was done by uh, Guye I'm not sure, uh, Gonzalez. Uh, so if you wanted to read his version, it's you know you can add like more things. You can obviously do the same thing for collection view. You know, DQ cell, register cell. Um, same thing applies here. Uh, and then uh, in Apple's uh, WWC video on Swift architecture. They also discussed a really elegant solution for uh, a similar thing with Segway identifiers. So uh, as you guys might know, with Segway identifiers, again, you have to use some kind of string-based system. What is just like reuse identifier with table views? So with Segways, you can do something similar where you can kind of take the string implementation, put it away, Kind of in a protocol and have a much nicer use case for using segways um, that's a lot more swiftier and has type safety and you know compiler warnings when things aren't matching up. Um, so the final layer is networking. Uh, so this is more kind of lower level. Uh, it's networking and testing. So you know you might have some kind of service. Um, so in this case, I have like an something like an interface for speaking to the API. Um, in Swift, I usually use like a result enum. You can you know abstract it even further, but I'm just going to hard code it here. Um, so you know all this is doing is um, it's, it has a method to get the food from the server. And when the server comes back, it's going to have a completion handler where it's going to pass in a result, and the result can either be success. And in that case, you kind of you know you know you parse the JSON, uh, you put it into an array, you pass in the result, um, or you know some error 400, whatever the error is, you pass that in. So um, the problem here is you know it's really hard to test and to work with. Um, this method because it is asynchronous. So, you know, it's not like a clear, nice functional world where you have an input and an output. You have to wait, you have to do all the work, you don't know when it's coming back. So, um, yeah, this is kind of a uh, way to do it um, that I use, or I, you know, I, I try to use. And the way you do use it is that. You know, you have a data source in your view controller, and again, this is very critical information because your, you know, view controller populates from information from the server. Uh, so as your view controller loads, it has to make this API call immediately, and when the data comes back, you have to handle the result as you know, res resetting the data source uh, with an array of food items, and now like reloading the table view or showing some kind of error to the user. Um, so this is pretty common 
Um, but the problem is uh, this is pretty much like the most important thing <laughs> in this view controller. It's a big dependency. It has to make this API call and it has to populate the food. And you know, you, if it's such a big deal, then you should be able to test it. <laughs> Um, and view controller tests are hard <laughs> uh, already, <laughs> uh, just on their own. Uh, but you know, like um, this is really important. You don't want someone being like, "Why? What is this? Get food and create their own service or like whatever, or just reload the table view and do something else." So you do want to test this um, and make sure it's calling the right methods. So then in the future, it is kind of you have some kind of certainty that this is working. Um, yeah. So, what can we do? <laughs> um, so the first thing is uh, we want to extract, you know, what are the dependencies and how can we make this more modular? Um, so the big thing is, you know, we have this food service that's instantiated within the get food method, uh, but really we want to kind of have more control over it because in testing, um, I want to have more control of what happens in that get API call or, or get food from the API. Because again, this is an asynchronous method and it's not, we don't want to be test. we don't want to be making server calls for the test. We just want to know this works. Um, and when I give it this result, the view controller behaves accordingly. We don't care that the API works. That's like a whole other test. So um, this is the get food method. I just took out the result stuff. Um, so by, we make it a little bit more injectable. So first uh, I had it as private, but now I'm just going to make it internal so the test can access it and call it and test it. Um, and instead of instantiating the food service, I'm going to actually pass it in. Uh, you can even have like a default parameter here. But, you know, you pass in the service, you get the food, you handle the result. So just by doing the small thing, um, I now have like a more injectable get food method than before that I can at least start moving towards testing. And, you know, this is the start kind of. <laughs> we have my test um, and I can now access the get food method and I can now pass in the food service. Uh, but now I need to have more control over it, um, and this is what it is. So, you know, I do not want to be touching the synchronous stuff. I don't really care about it. For the view controller, all I care is that it behaves like I want it to behave based on the result that I receive. So I need some way to inject it with the result um, that I want uh, for testing purposes. Um, so this is what it looks like right now. Uh, but um, one thing to notice is this is a struct, and the way to do this in Objective C would be to make it, it would be a class, and you can subclass and override the method. Um, that would be the Objective C way, but we're not in Objective C land. <laughs> so we're moving to a more swifty way to do it, which is keeping it as a struct um, and adding a protocol. So the protocol. Um, would be gettable because we're doing a get request to the server. Um, and this will have uh, an associated type result. Um, and associated types with protocols are like a weird land on its own. Uh, but basically, this means that by making it like this, any it's not just the food service that's going to behave this way. I can now have a dessert service that will also conform to this gettable protocol. And you know, I'll have consistency over view controllers. I'll have consistency over all my services that when they do a get request, they're going to conform to this protocol. And by having the result as an associated type, which is like a generic of protocols, um, I can, uh, you know, like any, uh, any service can implement their own result type. So that, that makes it like very uh, flexible to use across different networking stacks. So uh, how does this change food service? Not much. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the result enum is still the same. That's the associated type. 
And now any other dessert service can also have a result where on success it uh, passes in an array of desserts. So this stays the same. Uh, the only thing is instead of get food, I call it get. Um, and again, I have the same completion handler that's going to be called. So by extracting this into a protocol, I basically did not, you know, I didn't really impact uh, the food service much. It stays as is. But I already made my um, code a lot more reusable in the process. And I, I can reuse this, you know, same pattern across enforce that same pattern across different service layers. Um, so this is uh, where uh, associated types are a little bit weird, but uh, I can refactor my view controller where uh, instead of taking in a food service, I'm taking in my, you know, a gettable, so something that conforms to the gettable protocol. Um, and then the in this uh, view controller, I want to make sure that the result type, you know, because the result type is an associated type, so it doesn't have, it could be anything depending on which, uh, you know, which service it is. So I want to force this to be a food service result type, which makes sure to pass in an array of food. Um, so I have to use this little guard to make sure that the type is correct. Uh, and if it's not, then you know my view controller already will tell me it will crash and say, "Hey, you're using the wrong service. Whatever result you're using is wrong." Um, but once I get past that, you know I have basically the same code. If it's a success, I get an array of food. I'm going to re reset my data source, um, and if it's an error, I'm going to show an error. So overall, uh, hopefully, I think. Uh, the Swift team will make <laughs> protocols with associated types a little bit easier to use because uh, the key here is you do have to use the little generic syntax. You can't just say pass in a gettable. Um, but, you know, for, it's not a big deal. Uh, we, did, we had get food, food service. Now we're just passing in a, a gettable. Um, and then we have to check the type. And every single, you know, view controller that's going to use a gettable service will kind of have a similar code structure. So now you kind of have consistency across um, how you work with your APIs. Um, and now in your tests, you know, this is where the magic happens. Um, I cannot subclass food service, but I can create my own food service. That All I have to make sure is that it conforms to the gettable protocol to be passed in, uh, and that um, it, the, you know, the result type does have to be the same as the result type from the food service, which is the, the part that's the same. Because uh, you know, in my view controller, when I pass an array of food, I want to make sure that it assigns an array of food to the data source. So those are the only two things. Uh, but other than that, I no longer have to deal with any, any asynchronous stuff from the original. Um, all I care about in this fake food service is that my view controller is going to call it. <laughs> It's going to call the get method from the gettable protocol. Um, and that when I pass in you know, a success result to the completion handler, it's going to assign it to the data source. Uh, this is just you know, a starting implementation, but I usually have some kind of var also that says you know, result is success or failure, or you pass in a result. And now you can test the failure, you know, what happens if the a result is failure. So again, you put pass. You have full control over what you're passing in as a result. There's no time waiting. There's no like fakes or like fake JSON you have to parse because that doesn't matter for the view controller. <laughs> the view controller only cares. I get this result. What happens next? So um, yeah, so that's all you do. And now you can um, write your test. <laughs> So instead of um, having the food service that you pass in in the view controller, you just create your own fake food service that we just created for the test purposes. Uh, and now when you cal call get food for the view controller, you pass in your fake service. Um, so now your tests are basically saying, for my fake food service, which conforms to the gettable protocol, was get actually called. Um, the, the view controller's data source, you know, you can change how much is the count, you can add. I didn't have the equatable um, 
protocol implemented on my food value object. Uh, but if you have equa equatable, you can say, are these two arrays equal? You know, when I passed in my result with a data source um, of, you know, food, food items, does it actually match? Was it assigned to the data source? So now you have a fully tested, you know, kind of like a safe, when an intern comes and <laughs> accidentally puts desserts instead of food because they're confused, uh, this, this test is going to fail. Uh, and this is, again, the most important part of your view controller is to add, make sure the data source is correct. So it's very important to test. So yeah, so by using uh, protocol-oriented programming, uh, you make your you know, networking layer very uniform. So you can, again, imagine that for gettable, postable, delete, deletable, um, you can have these protocols um, and make sure that your networking is consistent, it's uniform, it's injectable, it's testable. You have a framework that's very simple, you know, not a lot of code that goes into your view controllers where you can actually really easily test it. Um, so uh, I wrote a blog post uh, recently on kind of using protocols in a similar way to do like injection with storyboards. Um, you want to check it out. And then this is the most important video to watch. <laughs> uh, I didn't cover, I didn't go into too much uh, on protocols with associated types, which we saw where the result was kind of a generic thing. But there's a lot of gotchas, and if you actually start working with them, you might get very frustrated, like I did this morning. <laughs> um, so when you get frustrated, uh, I recommend watching this talk. <laughs> um, and Alexis, he goes through um, and explains like sometimes there is no workaround, unfortunately. <laughs> they just don't work the way you want them to work yet. Um, but I think uh, he has a good point where if you don't understand why it works the way it is, maybe you feel better <laughs> about it or you're more forgiving. Uh, <laughs> so this is just like, as you're starting, this could be coming up and pretty important. Um, yeah, so today I talked about how to use protocol-oriented uh, programming and like very simple use cases of every day that we use as uh, Swift developers or iOS developers. Um, and it makes your code you know, safer, maintainable, reusable, modular. It's very, very nice. Um, one thing to note is that um, you know, protocols are not the answer to everything. <laughs> uh, I think uh, when I started understanding more about how to use them, now, like everything makes sense as a protocol, but you know, in the first example, when I made the shake um, method, it was only for one view, and at that point, that's you know, it's only in one place. That's fine. You don't need to make a protocol for every single function you add. Uh, but as soon as that code became duplicate, then you know, it was time to be like, okay, how do I refactor it? Okay, maybe protocol is the answer. Uh, but you know, in, Sw in Swift. Um, you can also use sometimes struct or composable objects might make sense. So um, as you're doing Swift, you know, maybe try a protocol, try a struct, try an enum, which one works better, maybe none of them. You know, it's, it's just something to experiment with and it's one of the big tools in Swift, but it might not, I think like, yeah, then what is that? Like if, you, if you're a hammer, everything is a nail uh, <laughs> uh, saying, but yeah. Like that's one of your big tools and it's very powerful, but, and I think, I personally, I think I overuse them right now because I'm new and it's like, oh, this is a cool new toy. Um, and I'm probably going to, and I think the same with like Storyboards came out and I, I just like overuse them because um, we don't know how to use them <laughs> yet. Or like we don't have, uh, with Objective-C, you know, after years of experience or whatever language you're programming in, you have kind of that feel, you've done this a hundred times this way, you know, you kind of understand which paths are, you know, are there, which ones are the best ones. Uh, with Swift, it's a lot harder, um, especially like, like I haven't done much protocol-oriented programming before, I haven't come from a language like that, so to me it's not a natural thing where I know that this is better or like a struct is better, I don't have that like sixth sense of like, Oh, I've done this before, like I know, I kind of know all the solutions. Um, so this is just to try. Um, and also, yeah, again, beyond these examples, 
there's just like, I guess, like I see it everywhere. Uh, one ex great example is like analytics. Um, so anything that's like a reusable identifier. So in analytics, you know, they, they clicked on this view, extend the protocol, um, and now you have like the identifier for that view controller of what they clicked. Um, so that just, you know, like one thing that popped up, uh, JSON parsing potentially. Um, there's just like a ton of use cases that you're gonna see. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's it's really fun. Uh, I think I don't know to challenge. I, I like to challenge myself because it's like a different way of thinking. Um, so challenge yourself and you know see maybe challenge yourself. Do something the way you usually do it, and then take a look at it again and say, can I use protocols? Try it out. Um, maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. Who knows? But <laughs> you're not gonna build that sixth sense of what is the right way to do it until you kind of keep practicing it over and over again and trying it in different scenarios. Uh, yes, that's it. <laughs> Protocol-oriented programming. Um, we have questions. Really good talk. I'm going to start uh, refactoring tomorrow with the uh, <laughs> So I was just wondering, uh, what's your preferred way of uh, adding those uh, common protocols to all your projects? Because I have a lot of like common protocols in my projects, but when I start a new project, uh, I just have to add them all, and that's yeah. a hassle. Uh, yeah, one way might be um, to put like all your view-based protocols into one file. Um, or just kind of group them, right? So I usually have like a file for it. Um, so try to see logical groups and break them out into files. Cool. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because usually they're short, so then it's weird to have one file for just like shakeable. Yeah. Thanks, that was a pretty nice talk. Uh, when you uh, declare a class and uh, conform to a protocol, do you do it the same place or you would prefer to make an extension of the same class and conform to a protocol? So when, when you have a class and you have shakeable and something else? Mm -hmm. uh, yet, uh, sorry. So, so like when you make, for example, a button and you can shake it's a shakeable, dimmable, mm -hmm. and something else, so you have mm -hmm. in one line, or you can say extension button and then shakeable mm -hmm. and new extension button and it's dimmable. So what's this preferred way and like what, what suggestion to do? Use different one? Yeah, so uh, in that case, I kind of like it in one line because I can just look at it. And if, um, if it, there's an extension of it at the bottom, uh, then it's, I have to scroll down to see it. But then if Shakeable has uh, required implementation, <laughs> so if, it's, if I have to do more than just extend it, then I would probably extend it and, uh, kind of in a separate place because then it's, there's code there. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> The first one is uh, about performance. Is there a performance hit to using this uh, protocol approach when you are calling functions and uh, do the classes become larger, that kind of thing? Um, Memory wise? Uh, I don't think I tested it, but I think there is. Because when you have like, with classes, you can have like final classes, so the compiler does optimizations. Um, but you know, protocols are part of Swift, so if, if the performance is hit now, like it's only going to improve in the future. I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, so I think, you know, the name of Swift is Swift because <laughs> they want it to be fast. Um, so I think, yeah, like other people might know better. Uh, but I, like for me, code is about readability uh, more than anything. If we want performance, we can type in ones and zeros. <laughs> and that'll be way faster. Um, so for me, like readability is usually the most important, and I haven't, you know, unless it's like noticeable performance hit, where like my, you know, it's just horrible. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the exact answer. Could you tell us a bit more about yourself? What do you do for a daytime job? 
what you like doing, making? Yeah. <laughs> and maybe like a selfish question, are you looking for a job? <laughs> Uh, so I work for myself. Uh, I quit my job, like in, I was a, like a San Francisco person <laughs> for five years. Uh, so lived in San Francisco, worked at a bank, uh, and then I ended up getting a new job, then quitting that job. <laughs> uh, so now I just do. I'm a digital nomad, like travel and um, do random things. It's not like a clear thing, but uh, the last thing I did, I organized a Swift conference in Tokyo. Um, so that was really fun. <laughs> so I was in Japan. Uh, and then uh, currently I'm like writing a book. I have a newsletter that I have sponsors for. Uh, I have a Swift job board, so you can post your job on there. <laughs> if you go to NatashaTheRobot.com, you'll see a link. Uh, so just random things. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, any more questions? No? Okay. You have to